Um, so to reiterate, I'm, I'm Glenn. Um, I work for Fundamentally Games, um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is a 101 into into game economy design, um, and it's it's more than being the the nuts and bolts of how a game economy works. This is more um, uh, the basics, running through some some concepts of, of what is involved in game economies, so giving you a working example, and, and teasing some sort of more intermediate ideas to, to get you into uh, maybe uh, expanding out into more reading about this this sort of stuff. Um, so this is Game Economies 101 um, by Fundamentally Games. Um, and the, the first thing I'll chat to you guys about is, is what is a game economy. So you you will hear you'll hear this phrase banded around a lot. Um, and when people hear it, typically they'll they'll come sort of conjure up commercial aspects of, of games, like directly to go straight to the commercial, um, like specific monetary systems, um, how much um, how much gold there is flying around in a game, or how much money they're making from the game. And, and these things aren't wrong, you know, they're, they're pretty much on the money, pun not intended, but I'll, I'll have it. Um, and depending on the kind of game you're building, your economy could be could be wildly divergent. So you could have a really fiscal-based economy, um, and that's cool. But, but often enough, like a real economy, there's a lot of non-fiscal factors at play. Right? So if, if we look at the real world, um, it's very much not just about the, the cash that we spend and earn. You know, there are commodities, um, all kinds of, of markets based around those commodities, and then extended uh, markets um, that are even more wild, um, as well as political factors and social factors that all kind of coalesce into, into what makes up an economy. Um, so depending on who speaks, you're going to get a pretty varied response um, on what a game economy is. You know, some some people will sort of harken back to something they've heard in a corridor around the office or, or wisdom they've got from from a mentor, um, something they read on a blog or something they've you know maybe they've got actually quite a keen understanding of it. And all these people have their own cuts on this, and none of them will be quite right and none will be quite wrong. And that's exactly uh, emblematic of a game economy. It's very similar. It's a, it's a good metaphor for it because they are so multifaceted and varied that it's, it's kind of nebulous to really tear it down. Um, but I think I think we can take a good shot at it. I have my take, which is what I'm going to give to you guys, but I'll just tell you a little bit about my history first so you, you have an idea of uh, who exactly I think I am to say what, what a game economy is. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm Glenn Fairweather. I'm the games analyst at Fundamentally Games, and I've worked in the games industry for around 10 years. Um, I've worked for studios like Jagex, uh, Space Ape, um, and now Fundamentally Games, um, and a couple of others in between. But they've all provided me with wicked uh, opportunities to learn uh, about balancing economies in, in live game scenarios. Um, my expertise has, has been quite centrally based around live ops and games as a service design, mostly for free to play um, on various platforms and various genres. Um, and as live ops and GAS is what Fundamental Games is all about, you can see why why I'm where I am today. Um, I've 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 seen a lot uh, go on um, in in these sort of economies. Uh, I've seen game economies flourish, fall over, and, and all sorts in between. And I've had the pleasure of designing systems and features that have brought uh, combinations of runaway currency balances. Um, back down to KPI friendly levels um, and I've designed features that have also caused rapid inflation of economies um, though I didn't hear any complaints at the time about the paired rapid inflation in player spend um, but that's 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 the fun of a game economy um, I mean I, I don't want to labor the point but hopefully this gives you an insight into why I think I can talk about this subject um, and now I'll, I'll, I'll crack on with what I think a game economy is so what is a game economy? Um, in in the in the simplest sort of in the clearest way I can I can phrase it, I, I would say that a game economy is the interconnectivity between every exchange in your game. So this is an exchange between players and games, between game systems and game systems, between players and other players. Um, so your your loops, your currencies, uh, concepts such as player power and progression, everything in your store. Um, everything uh, in, in player generated content, these are all these all contain exchanges and every time one of these exchanges takes place it becomes a part of your game's economy um, now that sounds simple and also huge at the same time and that's because it is, it's, it's really heavy to unpack uh, and I've spent a while kind of working out how to break this down in, in a way that I think is kind of 101-ish um, because the worst thing I think I could do really is overload you on the subject, um, the objective for me is to give you enough to feel like you get it 
uh, but not so much that you you need to go for a drink uh, at lunchtime or whatever time zone you might be in straight after watching a webinar. Um, so in this example uh, that you can see on the, on the slide now, um, what we're looking at is, is a game loop. And what you can see on this game loop um, are, are combinations of sinks and taps um, in action. And these in particular form um, the, the game loop of um, a quest loop, uh, but also a PVP loop. And that's the first concept I'm going to introduce you to. So with currencies and progression style exchanges, these are the things that are most visible to the player. Um, and they're easy to track for most casual players. So they're a great place to start when talking about game economies. And that brings us this very simple concept that I just mentioned of sinks and taps. I think if there was ever a 101 for game economy, it's this. If you think of it in terms of a bath, um, the, the, the tap on the bath adds water to the bath. The sink or the plug hole removes it. Now imagine you're in a bath, but there's no plug. You have full control over the taps, and your objective as someone designing the economy of this bath is to maintain a water level that's high enough for you to, to take a bath and, and you know, clean down. You want the water level to be high enough for you to achieve that, but not so high that it causes the bath to overflow. On, on top of that, you've also got to think about the temperature. Now, focusing just on the, on the, 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 the water level, there are things you can do, you know, as, as a designer of a, of a bath-based economy, you can try and do things like um, blocking the, the sinkhole with your foot. Um, temporary solution will work, will be effective, but the bath is going to overflow if you don't take your foot off. So, you, you know, you can't keep just putting your foot on and off of the sinkhole. You know, regulating the taps is going to get you a, a, a more automated uh, solution. There. It's very manual to keep putting your foot in and out of the sinkhole. And once you've figured that out, you get to move on to, to the next part of balance, which I mentioned, which is the temperature. Um, is the water the right temperature? Well, now you're thinking about two taps. You've got one tap for hot, one tap for cold. So you're not just balancing throughput of a single tap anymore. You're now dealing with uh, uh, sort of a multi-vector economy. Um, what is the ratio of hot to cold to maintain the temperature whilst also maintaining the level of your bath? This is things and taps, uh, and, and sort of the simplest metaphor that I can give you for game economies 101. Um, but there's, there's there's more to it than that. I, I want to talk to you. This is going to be sort of a rough and very fast um, sort of pace run through a few concepts. So we've introduced things and taps, and I'm going to introduce uh, types of utility. Utility is a part of what I mentioned at the start of, in that the game economy is every exchange. Utilities are um, are the type of exchange, and there are also utilities that are the uh, the forms of exchange or the forms of utility. Um, and what I'll talk through some of these now. So let's tell you about utility. So utility, they they kind of step outside what I'm going to go into soon, the big metaphor, but they're generally demonstrable concepts in almost any game you'll play. And there are four types. Um, you'll have subsistence utility. Um, these are things that we need. So um, think the, the image here shows you your out of world energy. So this is this is stuff that you can um, sort of consume and refill, uh, but stuff that you need in order to keep playing. So that could be hit points in a different game uh, or continues in a, in a coin op. Um, shortcuts, these are items which improve our chance to succeed. These usually take the form of player power, um, but can also be things like cheat codes or... Um, uh, progression mechanics uh, like tech trees and things, which is analogous with, with player power, but it's sort of obfuscated by being, it's not a plus one mace, it's you've got plus one in mace skill. Uh, we also have a social. Uh, these are things I get to show off. So these will be um, cool skins for characters or very rare items um, or um, uh, the, the, the purple colored rims for my car that, that I've got through being a VIP. And then there's strategy. These are items which will introduce alternative choices to, to the gameplay. Um, so in the example in the image there, that is a legendary card from, uh, from Hearthstone. Not everyone has that card. And using that card actually changes the dynamic of the battle. Um, so it's very cool. Um, 
in this in all of what I've just said there, you can sort of interchange words like items with level, gear, consumables. You know, it's all about sort of the context of your, you know, the game you're developing. But in there, there will most likely be some subsistence, some shortcut, some social, and some strategy. Um, these are the, the four key types of utility. And then we talk about them in terms of forms. So if we if we think specifically, let's say we talk about um, subsistence. So subsistence can come in the form of a consumable, um, which would be a one-time use thing. Think like a, a potion or a key or something along those lines, something that you, you need to progress, you need it in, in quantities, and you will use it. And once you use it, it's gone. It's a very, very powerful uh, form of utility uh, and very good for balance because it is it is there and it sinks something and it doesn't tend to create anything. It can, but more often than not, it will remove more than it creates if you are balancing it as such, which you typically will. Uh, capacity. Now, capacity uh, utility forms are things that uh, cap the number of, of things you can have, but possibly the number of consumers you can hold at a time, or they may cap, um, it may be a cap on the amount of experience you can earn in a game. And generators, sorry, just crunching ice. And generators um, are, are different to that. These are a component which creates uh, consumable concepts or creates items or effectively works as, um, as its own little mini tap. Then the best one, aspirational goods. These are desirable items players want to own or desirable statuses players want to achieve or desirable objectives players want to complete. And these are these are all the forms of utility. And I talk about utility because I want to talk about exchange, the big word. If you look at the four types of exchange, um, I think this is the next thing up from sinks and taps. So we've, we've been through sinks and taps. I've talked about utility. Now I'm talking about exchange. I think after I finish this slide, I'll probably check with Oscar if there's any questions, but we'll, we'll get through this one first. So there are four types of exchange. Um, as I said, this is the next step up from sinks and taps. And I think it explains the way that the types and forms of utility play out in, in real circumstance. Um, so first of all, you have grind. Grind exchanges uh, tend to uh, switch the, the player's time with things such as soft currency, um, XP, or other kinds of rewards. You have resource. This is, this is a closer to um, premium spending. So in this case, it's a re an exchange of um, something the player considers valuable in exchange for something the game or the developer considers valuable. So sometimes that will be cash for uh, game items. Sometimes it might be more, more simple than that. Sometimes it might be um, viewing an ad or um, sharing something to social media. That's quite common. Or um, adding a friend to a Facebook game is, is the old the, the old sort of thing you would do that was uh, a resource style um, exchange. Um, and then you have anchors. Anchors are very cool. Anchors are exchanges I cannot make directly. Uh, I can only do it through engagement with very specific features. Um, so, for example, a, a VIP system might be purchased via tokens that I earn through normal play rather than purchased as a resource exchange. So by engaging with the main game mode, I'll earn pieces towards being able to switch on VIP states for a set number of days, and this would be an anchor. And then ratchets, if, if you are familiar with... with programming are just sort of logic concepts. Ratchets are kind of like conditional gears. Um, ratchets cannot be reversed, and what they do is they open up more content. Um, and a great example of this is uh, ELO in games like Hearthstone. Um, so as I, as my ELO goes up, I am matched maybe with other people, and I go into different brackets of, of competition. Or it could be uh, like player levels in an RPG. You know, the higher my levels are, the more content becomes available to me. And this is a ratchet exchange. Um, Again, there are clear examples of this in just about any game you've played recently, and and I think they're kind of the coolest tools in, in the economy designer's belt. Like if you can if you can wrap your head around these, and I'm sure you can, and apply them, these can can help you sort of make your economy just a little bit more uh, sensible. Um, if this was talking about monetization, these last three slides I would have been talking purely in terms of um, how to use ads in app purchases and and subs. Um, but I think in terms of game economy, there are several things you can do that, that are similar. Uh, as I mentioned, ELO, you might not think ELO is part of your economy, but it absolutely is. Um, so if I do still have your attention, great. If not, then the next set of slides should, should boost that and keep watching. 
Um, but I'll open it up to see if Oscar has any questions at this point for me. Yeah, I mean, the key one, um, I think the, the reaction to kind of ELO, uh, you know, kind of scoring rating as an anchor, as a, as a kind of ratchet system uh, in the economy, um, is kind of an interesting one because I think, um, uh, like you said, the difference between game economy and monetization is a really key one. But it feels to me, this is the question, um, are they, are they, are, is the game economy and the monetization economy a different thing, or is the game economy a base upon which you build a, a monetization economy? I, th I think, I think again, it's, this is this is about what's going to be down to down to context of you and your game. But in most cases, your game economy will um, be built before your monetization, because until you can establish what is valuable within your game, you can't effectively monetize it. Um, in, in personal opinion. Um, so in this case of ELO, um, ELO works as a grind resource and also a ratchet because you're requiring players to exchange time and skill in order to receive this, and then you're ratcheting their, their content based on it. You could at that point make a resource exchange if players were struggling and skip the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the game economy is, is huge and it's, it's much more than just um, sort of mechanics balance. And that's what we'll get into in the next few slides. Yes, yes. Fantastic. Cool. So um, without much further ado, I will jump into the meat of the slides, which is Ball Economics 101. So in, in the rest of these slides, which I think it's about, about 20 more slides, um, but I'll, I'll work through them and sort of take questions at good, good intervals. Um, we're going we're gonna to look through effectively an explanation of the interconnectivity of, of all these exchanges um, through the example of killing balls in an MMORPG. Now, it seems like a simple thing. You kill a ball, the ball dies, you get a loot. It's hugely more deep than that. Um, and the implications for the game economy are, are actually sort of shockingly big. Uh, I mean, it's a familiar scenario to most players and, and you think, great, let's, let's go out and kill balls. But the added vector of there being other users um, is is huge. It has huge, huge impact, um, and allows us to to infer things like um, causality to to the act of killing a ball, because the game isn't just single player. Like in an RPG, um, things like runaway rewarding actually have much much more fundamental impact than than you would think on the health of the game. Um, so if we start with the most important resource in an MMORPG economy, that resource is time. So at its base, time. Uh, time equals XP. Uh, the the player will spend time uh, in exchange for XP. Um, so this is a grind. Uh, what we said is a grind exchange. Uh, time goes in, XP comes out, and the time required to kill the ball is something that should be proportional to the reward, which is the first thing you would think about as a game economist. You would think, I know that these balls are taking X seconds to kill and I would like my players to reach max level in six to 12 weeks. Uh, so I can, I can do that, create a nice curve, and there we go. Um, but it's, it's, it's way deeper than that, right? So fair enough, time goes in, XP comes out. Um, and in this case, sort of a level one player killing a level one ball should be getting XP that's balanced to XP time ratio. But when they reach level two, killing level one balls shouldn't. I don't think it should have the same XP ratio. I think it should progress because commonly, if a player is able to trivialize their content, they'll undermine the, the entire sense of progression that they would have had. Um, not always true. Of course, there is a, a power fantasy to be considered as well as the concept of skill versus grind, which is where a player can make the decision about how to be most efficient in their content um, within the context of their own skill at the game. Uh, for example, a, a skilled player might spend their time killing balls that they're simply too low level for um, by supplementing power with consumables, another exchange, uh, and another utility. Um, or a less skilled player might choose to go the opposite way and fight um, lower level balls because it's a reduction in risk. And this is, again, this is about player skill versus player grind. Um, it's, it's important to leave the doors open, these kinds of things. Um, because it lets your players decide on how they want to play the game. But it does mean you have to think of measures to, to protect the economy. Um, with the example of killing balls, there could be a point at which they stop giving XP um, to players based on the player level. Or, inversely, killing higher level balls might only give 80% of the XP that they would have got from a bar of the same level. And this is just the very start, sort of the tip of, of 
this kind of boring iceberg um, of, of what should happen in the exchange between the player and the game when they're giving up time in exchange for experience points. And this is this is sinks and taps. So in, in this in this sort of 101 slide here, the, the player is generating time um, because that is the only currency a, a player can generate. Um, and the ball is sinking the time. Um, killing the ball generates XP, and the XP is then sunk into the player's power. This is a, a simple game loop, in fact. Um, and that's why I give the example of start of game loops. But you know, there's 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 more to it. You know, there's, there's player behaviour uh, impacting on this just this very simple concept, which is that um, a casual player is likely to take the the path of least resistance at all times, um, and a power user is more likely to trying to get the greatest possible return on their time. So if we stick with this idea of XP to time ratio, then the grind exchange. Um, is, is needs to be thought of outside of just a simple bubble because there are all kinds of external impacts. For example, um, a player uh, killing or a player on their own in an area with three bars can earn XP more efficiently than a players in a group in an area with one bar because there are only so many bars to go around. Um, and this, this kind of thing is something the designer needs to be considerate of. And in fact, it's a supply and demand system. In fact, it's a sink and tap system where you are, you as the designer are the tap for the balls and the players are the sinks for them. Um, so you need to consider this uh, when you're designing like a zone for, for players to play in. Um, if this can't scale with demand, what this means is that players will be losing potential XP waiting for balls. Um, and as I said, grouping, how does that affect this kind of economy? What if I'm a really powerful, uh, what if I'm really powerful uh, even and the bar dies dies really quickly. How does that impact the economy and, and what can a designer do to balance it? There, there are so many layers at play here, um, such as win loss levels, or as I said earlier, the, the level of risk players are willing to take. There's also the concepts of exploration versus discovery, um, where what we're looking at there is, is players are, in, in this example, they're exploring your XP economy um, and discovering the most lucrative are the most um, efficient ways to to progress themselves or to gain uh, an advantage over the system i think I, I think i think just this one thing this idea of player the player factor i think i could probably fill the entire the entire section with this but um oh god i'm going to do a pun um, but it might get a bit boring um so i'm going to jump on and talk about this really really cool thing um it's, it's called hot dog economics so hot dog economics is a really, really good example of, um, of a designed economy. Um, the, this is a lot, it's going to be a lot like the bat, sinks and taps bath metaphor. Um, so sorry. Uh, when you want to cook some hot dogs, the two main things you need, condiments aside, um, are the sausages and the buns, or the brats and the buns. The problem is, is that the, the brats tend to come in packs of eight, and the buns tend to come in packs of six. Now this isn't an accident. This is this is this is a secret cabal of uh, of hot dog based product manufacturers and, and sellers that have got together and designed it this way millions of years ago, just to just to spite you now. So every time you buy one pack of each, you end up with six complete hot dogs and two leftover buns or two leftover sausages, two leftover brats. And in fact, unless unless you're either going to freeze pieces of food or serve 30 hot dogs you cannot break even on this and this is something that should be taking place in game economies and does all the time it's this idea that you you can get some of what you need uh, and you can get some of something else you need but you can never get them perfectly in balance um, so that you don't need to be playing in different types of content um, and this is this is how hot dog economics work. But you can apply it to all sorts of things like um, monetization, um, currencies, and things like that. You can have, let's say, you have a um, a new building in your game that you are you are offering to players if they can sink uh, ten thousand soft currency into it. Um, but they also need to sink in uh, thirty premium currency. Well, that's fine. They can they can go out and buy the premium. They can go out and grind the soft. But there isn't a direct path to either, um, or to both at the same time. Sorry. Um, 
and then we talk about different types of rewards. So we've covered what you get in terms of time, but there's another layer to this because obviously when you kill a boar, you get more than XP. So now you're exchanging your time for killing boars, you're getting XP, but there are more things that are going to come out of that boar. I don't know how it gets in there, but it comes out. Um, a great example um, tends to be typically um, items or money. Uh, and this is the second part of the same grind exchange because there's still a grind exchange. Um, but it's a new dimension of reward and it affects the economy differently to the XP. So it's no longer about who is grinding XP and what is the most efficient way to grind XP. There's now an additional layer, which is that while I'm doing that, I'm also accruing um, commodities. And commodities affect a different part of the economy. But when you kind of start looking at all the interconnectivities of these exchanges, it all becomes one big crazy spider web. So killing a ball now simultaneously affects two economies. Um, it's still sinking time, and it's sinking time at the same rate, but it's generating two things, XP and goods. As goods enter the economy, the supply of those goods increases. So we need a new sink. Well, uh, if the player's equipment is gradually damaged uh, by all this ball slaying, and they need food to survive, then we can sink the goods into consumable exchanges and consumable utilities, such as uh, food or uh, repair bills. Consumables, as the name suggests, are consumed, and they are they are, they are very powerful sinks. Um, I can't recommend using them enough where, where they are appropriate. Um, and the challenge at this point for the designers is, is to balance this boar economy to, to ensure that the rewards from killing boars um, don't work out to be more valuable than the time the player sinks into them. Because if this gets out of control, then what you'll end up with is either, either a game that's not fun um, because you've removed challenge, um, or a game where the economy hyperinflates to, to the point where players who are time poor um, get left behind. And that's where free-to-play starts to, to build its nest because they, they a lot of free-to-play games um, are sort of predicated on this concept of um, uh, cash rich time poor players which is why you see a lot of mechanics in, in free to play games use time or the purchase or the skipping of time as sort of the first step into into monetizing users but again the time poor the time poor if they can't spend could end up being left behind um so this is this is all kind of contextual and there may be instances where you do want this as part of balancing this idea of um, this idea of sort of uh, lots of things and things, um, or you might want it as part of balancing a larger picture, um, or encouraging certain behaviour. Um, so having items within boards that you can't get anywhere else um, will encourage people to go and and kill boards in order to get that kind of currency or that kind of good. And these these are pretty normal. Um, having more sinks than sources is always smart. Uh, it creates opportunities for the player as well as creating dilemmas. Uh, in a different game, it might create monetization options. And the challenge here is for, is for the player and the designer to be kind of at odds all the time on, on figuring out, the players fig constantly trying to figure out how to spend their time more efficiently. Um, and the designer is constantly trying to figure out how to, how to slow them down. Um, and the more of that slowing down you can build in ahead of time, the better. Uh, so now they've got, a, when they're thinking about killing these balls, you've got to consider two things. You've got to consider the XP and the goods. So it's multidimensional. And that's as a player. The player now thinks, I get my XP. I also get leather. I also get gold from the, the ball's pockets. <laughs> and this, this leads us into another layer of the economy, which is goods as a kind of social exchange, right? Um, so the goods generated from the bar, you, you know, a player in an MRPG can go out and, and sell these directly. Um, they can sell them to vendors. Um, they can put them up on um, auction houses. Uh, they can even, if they if there's a, a trade sort of profession game, uh, I mean a game in your in your uh, in your product, convert them into other types types of goods or items. Uh, maybe the bar is dropping leather and the leather has a good vendor value. Great. Well, depending on how scarce balls are currently and how useful the leather is. Um, that leather might hold more value um, with other players. In fact, if a second player can use the leather, to, <laughs> here we go. If a second player can use the leather to create an item that increases player power, we start to get into a really wacky place where the value of a bar 
um, is 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 super faceted. So it's like I kill a bar. The, val- the value of my time is I can in in ten seconds I can kill one bar. Well, one bar will will get me twenty XP. This numbers are made up. No, twenty XP uh, will get me five gold coins and will get me two pieces of leather. Um, great. So then what I'm doing here is as a player I'm thinking about um, its its value in terms of XP and the value of its goods. If I'm player two, I think about the profitable value of its goods um, and its its impact long term as a as a generator. Uh, that's the types of utility for player power. So not only is the death of a bar now creating XP and goods, it's creating a pathway to a power exchange or an exchange of goods in, all, in, in exchange for player power, which will sink something. But as as player power tends to do, um, it's going to affect it's going to affect something else. Ugh. It, it goes it goes wacky places. Um, you would not think there was so much going on with a bar. So everything we just talked about, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll do questions after this slide, some more questions, um, is I've, I've made this little sheet here. It's very rudimentary, but it, it gives you a good demonstration of what I'm talking about. Um, so the kind of interplay that is happening with this bar. So if I talk you through this, um, I'm going to use the really cool tool in here that lets me um, use a highlighter. Um, so in this example, um, there is the player. Oh, no, I'll use the pen. The highlight you can't see because it's yellow. So this is this is information about the player. Uh, the player's current level is level three. And balls are designed for a level three player. The reward for killing a ball is five XP, um, as well as a ball pelt, uh, which is worth 0.5. Um, in this case, we'll say it's gold. Worth 0.5 gold. Uh, the also in the area are spiders. Spiders are worth three XP, so it's less than a bar, but 1.5 gold's worth of goods drops from a spider. What the player knows are these things. The player knows, hey, this is how much XP drops, this is how much money I can earn. The player also knows they need 400 XP to reach the next level. Um, so this is what this is the, this is how it's this is how it starts. Um, in fact, yeah. So they'll they'll need they'll need four hundred. Oh no, they sorry, they have four hundred. They'll need uh, eight hundred reach next level to get to level four. Um, they'll also need um, let's say two hundred for a, a copper sword. Um, the designer at this point wants to make the player make meaningful choices about how they spend their time, right? But the player's got their own personal narrative. Their choices are based on how they perceive or interpret the designer, and these could be wild and emergent, right? And this is something we call a Columbo effect, which I'll come to. Um, but what the player's doing here is the player has all the inputs and it's up to them to figure out what the most efficient move is for them. And at the same time, the designer is trying to make sure the system is, is ready for them doing that or leaves the breadcrumbs for them to do that and kind of tells them um, in a nice way what to do. Um, so I'll, I'm going to leave that on screen. In fact, I'm not I'm going to move to this. Um, and, and Oscar, if there's any questions at this point, we can, we can go back to some slides and and talk through some of those. How could I possibly interrupt Columbo? Um, <laughs> best TV show I've made. Um, there was actually one point here, um, Devil's Advocate point from uh, Wooten. Mm. Um, uh, do you want to cater for a player that's got both time and cash poor? Do they add value to the game? Do you have any views on that? Which that's that's a player that is time poor and cash poor. Yes. I mean this this is this is a a purely casual. Um, if, if we if we use the example of an MMO, I mean, this is someone who only wants to pay their subscription um, and doesn't have a lot of time to play. Um, yes, absolutely. That the, there shouldn't be a barrier to them getting the same satisfaction out of the game as someone else, and your economy should should be considerate of them. Um, it's hard to to cater to everyone. Very hard. Um, normally, when we're balancing game economies, we're fighting against the people who um, who exploit the the holes in the economy. Um, but but there's always going to be something there for. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think player. in mobile mm. uh, people have start uh, have used for a long time, which I think is wrong, and I'm trying to stop people using the language, is the term whale, and mm. a lot of people are at, are chasing hunting whales, yeah. and that's I think to the detriment of the game, in almost every case. Um, what we're looking to do is to find people's natural level 
where they super engage. Yeah. So that means that you do want to support who people who are time and cash poor because they're not cash zero and they're not time zero. No, of they, course. They bring something to the party. And I think as long as we are, like you said, sensitive to that, it should be fine. I'm well, very I think I'm that, 20 minutes. So no, sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll stream through, but I'll just, just on that, just to cap that one off. So there, there's a thing from earlier. Hang on, let me go back. Yeah. Um, where we talk about resource exchanges. So what this is about is about providing something we think is valuable, something you think is valuable as a player. Now, in this case, as a player, I might think my progression is valuable or a boost item or some premium currency or some, or some uh, uh, soft currency is valuable. We can provide a very low friction exchange for that because something that we think is valuable as, as developers is for a user to watch an ad. And this is one example where you can cater to everyone. You can you can create these opportunities where um, the the, the cash-rich, time-rich person can still compete and can still take part by by watching a, a smartly valued ad. And as long as that ad provides good value to the player with as little friction as possible, it's win-win. Um, there's some really great examples of this in games like Arch Hero, if you want to go try those out after this. Cool. So, Columbo. Um, if you are familiar with Columbo, uh, then you might already know where I'm, where I'm going with this, which is wicked ironic because that's the whole point of what I'm about to say. Um, Columbo is a show, uh, it's kind of mystery slash detective show where a guy with a glass eye and a big coat potters around asking questions. Um, uh, but what we see as viewers, um, we see the crime as it unfolds. Um, so we know exactly what happened. Um, and we know that by the end, Columbo will also know what happened. And what we're actually watching is... is him sort of going around piecing it all together because we already know there's no mystery for us we know what happened um and this is what the player is doing with the balls right they know what we've done they know what we've designed they're not we shouldn't ever take for granted that they are uh, not absolute geniuses because half the time they are they really get it um they know what we've done and we know they know and we're just kind of staring at each other waiting to see how it all unfolds. Uh, and in Columbo's case, he tends, tends to end the show by sort of almost letting the criminal get away with it. And then he sort of does the uh, just one more thing bit um, and lays the whole thing out, right? And, and what this is, is this is, this is a cue. Uh, this is a cue that the time limit is up, um, not just for the killer who is now going to, or the, the criminal who is now going to, you know, face jail, but it's also a cue for us as the viewer that we need to have worked out how he solved it. Because he's going around asking all these questions. We don't really know how he's figuring it all out. But then he tells you it all at the end. Um, I mean, this is kind of like a game economy where we're just constantly playing this game of, of sort of logical or um, intellectual chicken with the player. Um, I have a personal theory that Columbo's eye is enchanted and that what we're watching is, is something he's already seen. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, back to the balls. In fact, no, back to the spreadsheet. Um, so in this scenario that I talked about earlier, the designer knows that if the player spends, let's say, 10 minutes slaying balls, they'll gain 1,000 XP and 100 copper. Um, if the player spends 10 minutes slaying spiders, they'll get 600 XP and 300 copper. Um, but as we've designed it, if the player optimizes their 10 minutes by spending five on each, they'll end up with exactly 800 XP needed to level up and 200 copper needed to buy the sword they wanted. It's not to say the player will go with that plan, but leaving those kinds of calling cards in there and creating that opportunity for discovery and exploration is is very big. Um, and uh, typically, players will see the pattern. Um, and again, as I say, it's about player discovery, which is very, very powerful. Um, exchange outcomes. So the player is now level four and has bought their sword for 200 copper from another player. Uh, this is an example of a ratchet mechanism and also of aspirational utility. Uh, the player wanted the sword, um, couldn't equip it before, before reaching level four. So they had to get to level four because they wanted the sword. Um, so that's a ratchet. They also had to get the money because they wanted the sword. This is another ratchet. Uh, in the player's eyes, all of the XP and goods have been sunk because they think, you know, they've sunk the money, they've sunk the XP, everything's gone. The time and the, the whole thing has, has been a nice big swap, but it hasn't. Because player two, all this time, uh, was exchanging their time to gather materials and craft that sword in the first place. 
Now, they chose to craft that sword because when sold for 200 copper, which is the current going rate, um, it gives a profit over what the market value of the ore would have been. Um, so the player has, has said, well, I know ore is worth this much and I can gather this much of it per hour. Um, I will gather this ore, I will craft this sword, I will sell it, and that will be a better use of my time than going out and getting the ore and selling it on the open market. Um, and they've made this assessment, and this is a good assessment, but who has set the value of the ore? Well, that is you and me. So in, in part, the designer, we've set the, the, at least some of the conditions for determining the value of ore. Uh, for example, the availability of mining nodes in the area um, should be controlled as part of the economy. Um, you know, there's, there should be just enough there for the second player to feel that they can obtain the amount they need, but not so much that they have a huge excess and, and create um, a sort of a supply overspill, which will drive down the value of the ore. Because if they do that, then it's actually better for them to go and buy the ore from the auction house and spend the time uh, killing boars to get the gold to buy the ore. And this is where the scales start to tip and you've, you've got to be watching for these things. This is another facet of how, how game economies can sort of run away from you. Um, but it's not just about us, right? So the, the player can, can have huge amounts of impact on it. Um, I've, I've, got, I've got a really cool example um, about how scarcity works in, in some MMO economies, which I'm going to switch to now real quick, which is um, the, the party hats in RuneScape. So a long time ago, there was a Christmas event in RuneScape. Um, and what the developers did at the time was they gave out party hats to players. Um, over time, those players left the game or sold the party hats to one another um, and, and exchanged them around. And, and you know, people who people who weren't there for the event wanted party hats. This created a, a demand um, and people who were there had the supply. Immediately, an economy forms around it. Um, and a few very cunning players uh, acquired party hats specifically to delete them. And they did this to reduce the supply and increase and inflate the demand, um, which then inflated the value of the party hats that remained in circulation. Where we're at now with party hats, which are still being traded constantly, um, is that party hats now represent a way to circumvent the gold cap for players in the game. So, they, so when you've got several accounts and, and tons and tons of gold flying around, if you suddenly want to move that gold around, you will uh, you will acquire a party hat in exchange for all of your gold. And then you put that party hat in your bank and it just starts to increase in value again. Um, and you want to trade it to someone else who wants to give you gold on another character, you give them the party hat, they give you the gold to each of your characters and it's, it's become this crazy uh, commodity. Um, but, you know, value isn't always proportional to scarcity. Um, value can be derived from intrinsic qualities of items as well. I mean, uh, powerful items are often more valuable than weaker ones when we're talking about player power. But inversely, like really good looking items can be preferred over powerful items. Um, it's, it's, again, this is, it's all context based. It all depends on your game, your economy and what your players find valuable. And that's what your economy needs to reflect and, and sort of work around it is this concept of what is valuable to the player and come back to the question we had earlier about monetization that is where monetization that is that is the seed that the monetization grows from it's what does your player find valuable and what do they have to exchange in order to get it we exchange for a few reasons coming back to this concept of exchanges um i i'm a big fan of the concept of anticipation um because it's one factor of exchange and of value that gets overlooked quite a lot. Um, it's not the only reason people make exchanges, but it's one of the ones I'm going to focus on. Uh, and it's because things like opportunity cost and abnegation and social capital are all very, very powerful. But there's, there's just something about anticipation that's really, really important to consider. And in the example of what we talked about with the bars, it's, it's why do players want XP in the first place? Well, the first reason they want to get to the next level. But why? Well, at the next level, it's mostly more of the same and the numbers change. Um, and in fact, if the economy is designed right, the progressions through those levels follows a very nice curve where the player is constantly chasing the anticipation of the, the, the momentary reward of reaching the next level. And once they're there, as I say, it's monetary. So this mo momentary, so they just start the cycle again. And I, a lot of the time, the same will go for items in your game. 
Um, a player will be very excited about getting the incredible hat of unity. But once they have it, they have it. Some of its value is immediately lost. But that value, that value is there in first place. And, and we seized on it by building anticipation for things. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to do a little poke and see what else we've got. One sec. So um, if, you're not, if you're not bored yet, um, then that's good. But I'm going to stop with the bar economics bit and just move into sort of the bar metaphors and just move some sort of clearer stuff. Um, so what I've got here is uh, what, what this kind of all adds up to, which is a, a model for understanding the, the sinks uh, and taps and the systems within your game and how they kind of all add up. Um, so this is a chart that you could you could mimic if you wanted it, and what you can use it is in your your game design documentations um, to help you implement the economy of your game, and, and even act as a sanity check when you want to add a new sap or sink or, or just adjust the number of coins a ball has in its pockets, right? Pockets. Um, so this first section uh, here describes the the player, um, and what you can see in in here is that items um, the player sinks. And items the player generates. So as you see at the top, it's it's what the player is sinking, and on the bottom is what they're generating. Um, sometimes what they're generating is, is a direct exchange for what they're sinking. Sometimes it goes around the houses a little bit to, to kind of you know sort of reach uh, fulfillment. Um, so what's happening here um, is the the player in this particular example is um, generating time. And it sinks consumables and anything that increases player power. The time it's sinking is going into this action phase here of uh, killing balls. So killing balls sinks time. Killing balls generates XP and goods. These go to two different places. XP um, is part of your progression system or your progression loop. So XP is sunk by this and creates player power which is sunk by the player, creating a very nice sort of loop for time into XP, into player power. Player power increases, reduces the amount of time needed to kill bars, increases XP, increases player power. Um, and this is a nice sort of uh, loop. Um, goods, however, also generated. And these go into goods-based rewards. Um, in this case, it will be consumables or possibly even items that create player power. Uh, these then go back into the player who syncs them and begins to generate more time. The only thing that I haven't really touched on this is this last section, um, which is when we start to look at things you can do um, in terms of um, monetizing. So I have one example of IAP, but this could just as easily be watch an ad um, or join a VIP program um, or, or share something on, on a social media site. And what happens is you'll, you'll perform one of these exchanges. This is a goods exchange. You'll perform these exchanges. Um, and then out of it, you'll receive something you desire. Um, in this case, we know that the whole reason the player is playing this game right now is to, is to get XP, to get power, to get more XP, to get power, to get more XP. So we leverage that by giving them a chance to receive an XP boost for watching an ad. Or temporary power for watching an ad or for joining uh, a service or for sharing something. And this is this is kind of the the, the bedrock on which um, a lot of freemium concepts are built. And it's it's very, very good and very, very powerful. Um, so if, if, if we're at this point, I've, I've either finished on time or um, as we know, Oscar's accelerated me a little bit, telling me we have about 20 minutes left. Um, I think we're probably in the last five or so, but what you've heard in this is, is Kind of the mad ramblings of someone who's a bit obsessed with with, with killing balls, but also, um, <laughs> not that I've said it more than sixty times, but it's also one on one on what a game economy is. Um, now, if you've absorbed it, if you stuck with us, you either have learned one of two lessons, which is one, uh, number one is that the the game economy is the interconnection of all exchanges in the game, and please, please let that be the thing you take away from this: that the game economy is the interconnection or the interconnectivity between all the exchanges that take place in your game in every system. If you didn't get that lesson from this, I hope you didn't get this lesson from this. Uh, my name is Glyn, and it's been a pleasure speaking to you on behalf of Fundamentally Games. And if there are any more questions, 
That is fantastic. I'm going to leave this slide up for our free resources if you want to have a look at that. Great stuff. Good. Uh, thanks, Vin. And don't worry, you didn't bore us. Um, <laughs> oh, I had to be done. I wasn't the, one, the first one to make this joke. Um, uh, there was uh, various comments like um, what was saying, uh, at least it's keeping us from being bored. Um, anyway, so yes, had to, had to happen. So um, there was a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to go to one from uh, Nelson. Um, he this was is my favourite bit. Yeah, he was specifically saying, how do offers and discounts come into this economy? Now, I did mention in the text chat, there are two areas where you looked through the anchors, uh, the ratchets, the grind and the and resource, when you were talking yes. about through with the previous question, but also obviously in that um, sinks and sources map that we were talking mm. through earlier. But do you have any kind of comments in terms of how do you avoid cannibalization when you're using these kind of offers and promotion experiences and discounts? I think it's just about being on, on, on top of what's going on. So I there's never, in my eyes, there's never anything um, inherently bad about applying discounts and offers, as long as you're applying them smartly. So you should, you should as um, someone working within your own games economy, and especially if you're the designer, know exactly where you need an offer and why. Like an offer should never be created for no reason. An offer should be created for a purpose. I, I'll give you a working example. So um, on a free-to-play base builder game that I worked on once, um, we, we noticed that players were, um, they, they kept stockpiling currency. Um, and we didn't know why. I, I can tell you why later, but but what we what we would do is we'd often introduce um, new objects to the game that would be designed to sync those currencies. And likewise, if, if we were going to release something soon that were, would require a lot of currency C, for example, like the, the, the black crystals or whatever they might have been, um, we would introduce a discount on black crystals either before as part of um, live ops content to sort of tease the release of the next thing, or after as a catch up mechanic for people who hadn't um, hadn't been able to earn enough to get it through natural play. Um, so I, I, I would never, I would be careful using the term cannibalize because cannibalize um, is usually a word that we use to describe it damaging um, damaging the the revenue rather than damaging the the economy itself. Um, because you can always pull more more levels and add more taps to your economy, but your monetization is what can can, can go very very wrong. Cool, cool, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the cannibalizing point is a really important one. Particularly, it does feed into the next question, which actually comes from a former employee, um, and uh, she's gone off and become a game producer elsewhere. Uh, so Becky was asking about as a producer, she's got an artist coming to her telling her to stop everything because you need to hot fix the game because there's something in the scenario in the scenery rather. The environment is wrong it's the wrong color of blue or whatever uh and obviously you know you say no but then the monetization designer comes up and says the we just patch everything immediately because the economy is unbalanced um what questions should she ask in order to know that it's serious that's a brilliant one wow so i mean th th realistically the first thing you'd ask is when when they're saying to you the economy is is, is has a problem you need to know what the problem is. I mean, sure, they'll tell you what the problem is, but seeing evidence of that and knowing how that has a knock onto your KPIs is going to be the first thing in you assessing whether or not you need to act on that. Um, because the, you, you can you can throw sinks and taps at a game, but sometimes if you throw them in too hastily, you will put some in that might have knock-ons elsewhere. Like, like I've tried to show with this talk is that even just the simple act of killing boars is so multifaceted that sometimes you have no idea what you're going to impact when you change something. Um, unless you are so deep in the spreadsheet and, and you have gone to absolute spreadsheet matrix land, um, you, you, there will always be unforeseen circumstances. Um, but yeah, ass assessing assessing the damage, like like anything you would assess um, sort of feature-wise, you're just assessing the, the potential for damage on the KPIs, I think. Yeah, and I think um, you know, making sure you don't take the blue pill and the uh, matrix spreadsheet mm. is really important. Um, but actually, on, on that point, I think one thing that's interesting is that if your monetization designer if your monetization design has been done in such a way where he has to basically hot fix the game, you've done it wrong. Uh, I, I, frankly, you know, you this is, needs to be stuff that's manageable in the server. You need smart DevOps setups. You need smart configurations. You need to be able to manage them on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to coordinate events and promotions. But I think key to this is that it's about data. Data is king. And, and this is, again, why the anchors and the uh, ratchets in particular, but also the grind and the um, 
and the resources by changing how much you get by grinding, by changing the balance of resources required for each piece, by changing what elements can only be obtained through play and you know, cherry changing the proportion of them that's needed, and by creating the ratchets to decide where these things become available or not, that's how you can balance the economy. So, yeah. frankly, um, the monetization designer hasn't done the job properly, in my opinion, if you're having to do a hot fix to the game. Because we should have thoroughly tested all that in, you know, uh, closed beta, open beta, soft launch prior to getting to this point. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, so I think I think that kind of sums that up. Does anyone else have any other questions while we're at it? Oh, there's another one here. Um, yes. Oh no, sorry. It's just a, a, <laughs> Becky is sending me a message back telling me what updating. <laughs> <me> on... <laughs> I thought it was a question for a second. I think we uh, can we can do that one offline. I think and give good good uh, good examples. <laughs> exactly. So there's plenty plenty of other examples. So I think on that note, I think we're there. I mean, I, I, just to sum up, um, hopefully you guys have got a good sense of the thinking process behind game economies obviously as a as a team we're heavily involved in the live ops of different games we actually do a lot of work to try and help fix people's monetization design uh, in general um and obviously a lot of that comes down to being able to um uh, assign um you know structures and game elements around the player as a layer before you get to the monetization quite quite often i find the biggest problems I have with a game that's not working is that I have to fix the first time user experience and sometimes the second time user experience, meaning not the very first time they play, but when they repeatedly play. Uh, and often that's the core issue. And particularly back to a point that Glenn was making about anticipation, but um, this idea of anticipation of fear of missing out uh, and social capital, these things create reasons for people to care. Mm. And the game economy only works if people care about what what's happening. Uh, and so that's why it's so important to us that we're focusing on the game design part in order yeah. to think about how we influence the monetization part. Yeah, I think just as a sort of a, a, an additional sort of bonus thing, um, when when you're designing your game economy and when your sort of your game economy team or your live ops guys are coming to you with problems or you've seen problems as a producer or as someone who's looking at the KPIs, there, there's often really, there can sometimes be really strange reasons for why you see what you're seeing, um, and assessing it's half the battle. So I, I can give one example where um, I saw um, a trend taking place uh, within a play base game I played where everyone was, everyone, everyone was storing up um, all of their currencies, and they would do this all the time. No matter what we did as as a team, we could never. We could never change the ongoing trend of balances rising. No matter how many sinks we threw, the balances would always go up over time. And the reason they're always going up, after actually going out and interviewing some of our players, some of the sort of the big players, we discovered that the reason they were going up is because they had built in their own emergent way within their communities this this kind of rule or ethos that they should never spend more than half of their stock. And the reason for it was out of anticipation for the next set of content to be released. When the next castle level comes, they're ready with the money to buy it. And what they would always do is they'd always save however much it cost them last time. And anything over that, they could spend freely. But they always had that kind of minimum uh, balance that they tried to maintain. And we had no idea. We were throwing everything at it to sink it, and it just would not sink. And as I say, it just turned out that it's just, it's just completely emergent player behavior. And that it's natural because it was not affecting our ability to monetize. No, but it does. It, what it does is it impacts your ability to predict, and it does suck out life yeah. from the economy, which is a not necessarily a great thing. Yeah. There's a couple of things that come to my mind on that. So, I know my personal instinct. And I've seen this. I've observed this with players in general. Is quite often how many coins you have in the bank is your sense of purpose. Yeah. And if that's the case, there's not enough being done to show your sense of progress in the game mm -hmm. if it becomes the only way you can see how good you're doing you're going to actually create friction on their willingness to spend yes so you've got to create this that's why fear of missing out the kind of opportunity cost is so important because if you don't give somebody a reason to act they will not act um the, the other thing i think is really interesting i think it ties into 
that model, that anticipation, mm. um, opportunity mm. cost, social capital and um, abnegation, that model abnegation. comes from a piece of work done by R. Bauer in 1960. And it's not about games. It's actually about uh, any purchase behaviour. What abnegation means is we as purchasers have to give ourselves permission to buy. We have to set aside, that's what the abnegation bit means, the other things, the our other responsibilities, the other things we should be doing. And so without thinking about the full psychology of the player in their behaviour playing, let alone when they're spending, we won't have the impact and the meaning that's required to motivate players. There's one last thing I was going to ask. Um, the um, One of the things you talked about was the people working out the strategy uh, in terms yes. of this balance with spiders and balls. Um, I actually think what's interesting is a, a, a talk that um, the guys at um, Magic the Gathering did, you know, the Wizard of the Coast guys, uh, at GDC in around 2011, and they talked about the power of ambiguous strategy. So... There is no one way to win Magic the Gathering. But if you were to look on the internet, you would find thousands of people will tell you that there is and that they found it. So is that, is, is that ambiguity something you can design into your economy? I, I, think, I think people could. Um, I, I, I think it would be an interesting challenge for any designer to, to design for ambiguity. Um, often it could it could very accidentally become um, designing for accidental uh, rather ambiguity, but but certainly it's possible. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of a sort of a decent uh, a decent example to suggest regarding that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult. I think the, the balance is that you've got to decide between complexity and simplicity. Mm. You want ambiguity, so you don't want to give people basically... In fact, the example I use is um, In-N-Out Burger. Uh, okay. For those of you who've seen The Big Lebowski or have been to California, uh, will probably know this you, you know, odd um, McDonald's-like um, you know, local uh, uh, burger joint. Uh, and they have a secret menu. Or at least it used to be secret. It's now basically plastered on the wall. It used to be completely secret. So if I asked for a double-double, um, I would get a uh, a burger and cheese, burger and cheese. Uh, if I asked for animal style, I'd get this particular kind of... Um, these burgers would be cooked in kind of onions and, and Thousand Island dressing. And I could even buy animal style fry fries. I could buy a black and white, which would be a mix of chocolate and, and vanilla milkshake. Now, so what? the fact that it was never publicized made it appealing yeah so people had to work it out through word of mouth which meant that they felt special because they knew and therefore they were part of the tribe that knew and i think that's part of what i think makes great game economies and um, understanding that different people have different levels of engagement with the game and that's okay there are different streams but giving people who are really into the game a sense of, of personal law can really double down their engagement as well. So I think we're done. Um, cool. So, yeah, I think that's it. So and has anyone else has got any questions, if you guys have a game that you'd like to have reviewed, um, as been as highlighted on this slide, we're doing game reviews at the moment. Uh, obviously, we're particularly looking for games as a service because that's what we do. But we're happy to look at the game, the market fit, the mechanic, the retention design uh, and monetization design review. And for smaller companies, indie studios, if you're pitching, um, we can even do a game pitch review. So uh, you just need to tell us if that pitch is intended for publishers or for investors um you, if you're interested in finding out what events are going on obviously in this marvelous online world we need to keep track we try to keep a list of that so there's an events calendar on our website under the knowledge base we also have a list of all the finances out there uh, particularly those who invest in the uk and there's a whole bunch of articles on our knowledge base as well and this uh, recording will be shared out with you guys first with the slides uh, and then we'll eventually make it onto uh, YouTube and uh, will be made available for other people to see as well. Um, obviously, if you have any comments, questions or thoughts, we're also going to send you out a survey just so we can get a, a sense of how much uh, you got, gained from this, whether there's ways where you can improve it. And of course, if you have any other further kind of uh, interests or requests to find out more about what we do, just go to fundamentally.games. Uh, I think that's it. So good. I think so. The last slide. 
I have this one. This is the very last one. Yeah. And so basically, if you want to find out more, uh, you know where to find us. Uh, you know how to get in touch with us. Uh, and obviously, feel free to ask any questions. Oh, Thank one you. quick point that Wouter made. Uh, I was being a bit mean, saying don't fix, don't hot fix a game if the monetization designer comes up to you. Uh, he's absolutely right. There are circumstances where there are holes which are technical and you should fix them straight away. Um, but, you know, it, I was being flippant when I said, if you, you, you know, you don't fix it because you should have done your job properly because that, that's not really true. Well, this is why I said it's, it's you know, establish the evidence, establish severity um, and priority and, and work from there. Um, if, if it's having an impact on your KPIs, you're obviously going to need to do something about it. Yeah, exactly. And, and KPIs uh, include player, player satisfaction and, and things yeah. like that. And I think that's the thing, you know, what we, what we always try to say is that it's about the game first. You know, engagement comes first. Retention is second. Without engagement, you don't get retention. But monetization is third. And without retention, you don't get monetization. For me, the biggest and most important thing is repeat purchase. If you can prove that your players are repeat purchasing, that means there's something in your economy that's right. If they're not repeat purchasing, that means there's something in your economy that's wrong and broken. Um, and actually, you know, um, Tijun was also saying, and I made a point about low spenders being important, but big spenders are important too. So when we're talking about repeat spenders, we're talking about maximizing the super engagement of players. What that means is, every player will have their own spend point and we want to maximize that for the economy of the game and the benefit of the game but we want players to feel satisfied and rewarded and fully engaged and they want to spend money in games that they love and they take on board as their hobby they want to spend money provided we're delivering them value that's why we talk that's about utility yeah. utility means value satisfaction of needs and on that note uh, thank you very much folks and uh, hello thank to uh, those in Finland who've just posted um, uh, Ubi Design hey, yeah. um, I think I know who that is but I can't quite tell from the name I'm guessing <laughs> but uh, wherever you are um, hopefully you've had a great um, uh, time listening to Glyn um, and uh, I know it's been a challenging year but at least um, we're hopefully seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of this uh, particular Covid era and um, it'll take a little while yet before we're back into physical meetings, but we'll continue to try and pull on um, new webinars each each um, month. And uh, we'd love to get any kind of feedback from you about how we can improve them and also what topics would be important. In case you're not aware, we're also helping the Pocket Gamer team doing uh, uh, longer charged uh, masterclasses, so three hour sessions. Uh, and I'm currently going through a process of trying to identify what um, future masterclasses uh, would be relevant for people and interesting to people. So again, if you've got any thoughts and suggestions, we'd be delighted to do that. And uh, uh, as some of you may know, I help with the line out for the Pocket Gamer event. So if you have any interest in new speakers or people who we should try and encourage to speak there, then obviously please feel free. So finally, um, you know where we are. Uh, if you want to talk about live ops, if you want to talk about game monetization, uh, please reach out to us. We don't bite. Well, not too hard. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll speak to you again soon in the new year. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.